Hey everyone, I hope you've been having a good week. Uh, today I'm going to be preaching on Acts chapter 15, uh, verses 36 to 41. But I'm going to read Acts 15, 22 to 41 to give us a little background. This takes place after the Jerusalem Council, where the church decided that Gentiles could come into the church just as they were. They didn't have to become uh, Jews first and come under the Old Testament law, but God welcomed them, in, them into the church just as they were. So let me read beginning in Acts 15, 22. <clears throat> then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, as seemed good to us, having come to one accord to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these things, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, with many others also. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Well, let's pray before we look at this passage. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon this time. Lord, may your Holy Spirit, who you've given us as a counselor and someone to guide, lead and guide us in all truth, do that now. Open our hearts and minds to understand what this passage meant then and how it applies to our lives now. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening in Jesus' name. Amen. When we look at this account, several obvious questions spring to mind, not the least of which was, why did Paul, I mean, excuse me, why did Mark uh, desert uh, Paul and Barnabas on the earlier uh, first missionary journey so that this dispute arose among Paul and Barnabas whether they should take him on the second one? Of course, the Bible doesn't say, so we can't know for sure, but there have been several reasons suggested. Uh, one suggestion is that uh, Mark is a relatively young man, was not used to much hardship, and so when the going got tough, uh, Mark got going in the opposite direction. <laughs> Some have pointed out that Mark came from wealth. Uh, his mother, of course, owned that upper room, that big house where the church would meet in Jerusalem, so it had to be a significant place. So it might be that Mark had come from a pampered background, a wealthy background, although being wealthy doesn't necessarily mean pampered, or that you won't perse persevere through difficulty. 
But it could be that when things got difficult, he grew homesick and just longed for the comforts of home. This theory is uh, given some support by the fact that Mark had left the first missionary journey just as it was entering into a tougher stage. Uh, Cyprus, uh, the first place where Paul and Mark and Barnabas had gone on that trip, uh, that was Barnabas' hometown, his homeland. So Barnabas doubtless had many connections there, people he knew, and a level of comfort there. And, and Mark was Barnabas' cousin, so uh, Mark probably knew a lot of the people there, had a certain uh, comfort level there. It's possible Mark had even visited Cyprus in the past. We can't be sure of that. At any rate, uh, that wouldn't have been as tough a st uh, stop for Mark to go to Cyprus. That would change, though, in the next leg of their journey when they went uh, from Cyprus to Perga in Pamphylia, and that was located in, in Asia Minor on the coastland of modern Turkey. Uh, this, the southern coast of Turkey, or Asia Minor at that time, was notorious for sickness and malaria. Uh, some have even suggested that the reason uh, Paul didn't preach there along the coast uh, was because of that, because of sickness. But instead he headed up north where the mountain air was cl uh, clearer and there's less chance of getting malaria, some other disease. And so he might have even gone up there. Uh, to the highlands of the cross of Antioch and Pisidia to recuperate. Uh, when Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians, which apparently was sent to these mountain region churches, uh, he said that it was due to sickness that he first preached the gospel to them. So he might have left the coast and gone north to the mountains uh, because of sickness, and he preached there. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you, he says. It could be then that uh, Mark looked at the potential illnesses that might lay before him, and like many a would-be missionary said, well, I don't want anything to do with that. And that was not the only uh, danger Mark would have faced. Uh, in order to get from Perga along the coast to uh, Pisidian Antioch in the mountains, you had to travel across the Taurus mountain range. Uh, it was one of the most dangerous routes in the world. If the cliffs didn't get you, <laughs> the bandits very might, very well might. It could be that the young, inexperienced Mark took one look at Paul's map and his itinerary and said, I want nothing to do with this, and he decided it wasn't for him, and he headed home. That's one theory that uh, this young man, Mark, simply wasn't ready for the challenge at that point in his development. Another theory that I don't think is as likely is that Mark resented the fact that Paul had kind of supplanted Barnabas as the leader of the ministry. Uh, Mark might have been content when his cousin Barnabas was in charge and giving the orders, but when you know this upstart Paul comes along and starts bossing him and Barnabas around, he might say, well, who's this guy Paul to give us orders? It's clear from the book of Acts that Paul did certainly overtake Barnabas in terms of the ministry leadership. Uh, in up till Acts 13.2, it's always Barnabas and Paul. But after that point, on the missionary journey, uh, Paul's leadership skills obviously asserted themselves. He kind of took over the mantle. And from that point on, it's Paul and Barnabas. So there was definitely a transition there. And it could be that Mark resented the fact that Paul had kind of stolen the limelight and uh, power from his cousin. The chief problem with this theory, though, is that we, there's no indication that the humble and godly Barnabas ever resented Paul's taking uh, this position of leadership. And in fact, that's precisely why Barnabas had sought Paul out, because he, he admired his leadership skills and thought he'd be great for the job. So while this theory is possible, I don't think it's very likely. Uh, a third uh, theory as to why Mark might have deserted them on the first missionary journey and headed home was that Mark saw the direction that Paul was taking in his ministry in terms of reaching out to the Gentiles apart from the law, apart from the synagogue, apart from circumcision, and he didn't care for that. Um, some have even suggested that Mark was might have been intentionally or unintentionally the one who went back to the Jerusalem church and said, hey, Paul's reaching out to the Gentiles and not expecting them to come under the law anymore. <clears throat> 
and he might have caused that whole stir, although there's no direct evidence of that, of course. But Mark was from the very conservative uh, church in Jerusalem, which was uh, less wild about having the Gentiles join them just as they were, and um, much more into the ceremonial law as well. Uh, and um, so they were much less open to the Gentiles than Paul and Barnabas were, were who had lived among the Gentiles outside of uh, Israel, and so were more used to it. Uh, it says in Acts 13 that Paul and Barnabas were in the habit of, as I'm sure you know, of going to the synagogue, the Jews first, and preaching there. Uh, but he was getting rejected a lot, or they were. And so Paul says, you know, from now on, whenever and wherever the synagogues reject us, you know, we'll go to the Gentiles. He said, we had to preach the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles. And so, you know, the gospel through the Jew first and also the Gentile, and Paul observed that rule, but he would go to the Gentiles, of course. It could be then that Mark had some inkling of where Paul was going in his ministry. He didn't really like that direction and uh, that it would be apart from circumcision or the ceremonial law. And so he decided to head home. And that could explain, too, why Barnabas, uh, who had had his own issues with accepting uh, the Gentiles at times and Galatians, he kind of headed over the other side for a while and said they have to keep the law. Uh, he might have been more sympathetic to Mark's doubts that he had recovered from and wanted them back versus Paul, who had never had any doubts about the Gentiles coming in just as they were apart from the law. So that's another theory that uh, Mark had troubles with reaching out to the Gentiles on a large scale without reference to the law or to circumcision. Of these three main uh, theories, I tend to favor the first one, that Mark was just a young guy who was in over his head. He wasn't quite up for the challenges at that point, uh, but he later would be. Uh, but, you know, the other two theories have something to, to uh, think about also. However, even though we can't be certain and can only speculate, I think there's some value in doing that because... Uh, not only does it help us assess disputes in the in the Bible, but also our own disputes that we uh, encounter from time to time. And and the value is this is that or the lesson is this that uh, when we don't know the all the given facts in a situation, we be, should be slow to judge and slow to take sides, slow to condemn one and condone another, or vice versa. Uh, for example, if Mark was just a young guy in over his head and he, he had just um, panicked and made a mistake, then we'd probably be much more sympathetic to Mark and Barnabas's point of view of, you know, let's give him another chance, let's take him along. Uh, you know, Barnabas might have said, look, Paul, he's a young guy, you know, it's his first time out, he messed up, but he realizes he made a mistake, so why don't we take him along, give him another chance, what do you say? On the other hand, let's say that Mark had real trouble with the idea of Gentiles being welcome to the church as Gentiles apart from circumcision and the law. And that's the reason he had gone AWOL previously. Uh, he was shaky on the idea of accepting Gentiles into the church without their becoming Jews first. Would, would I want a guy like that on my missions team um, if I was heading out to reach Gentiles soon, enough, soon after the Jerusalem a council especially which had settled that issue in favor of uh, Paul's point of view. Uh, would I want a guy along who was shaky on that very issue that I was going to teach the churches about? Well, of course not, I wouldn't. And so if that was the case, I think we'd be much more sympathetic to Paul's point of view. And Paul might have said, you know, sure, we can take Mark along at another time, but not right now. You know, he's, he's not ready and this is too important for the church. Let's give him some time to get some seasoning to develop on this issue, to settle it, and then we'll bring him along the next time. So it all depends on what the circumstances were. And as I said, that's a good rule for us to live by also. You know, we should be slow to judge, slow to condemn, slow to take sides, one way or the other, until all the facts have come in. You know, one of my favorite proverbs, you know, one person's side seems right until the other person states their case. And so... Uh, we always need to do that.
given the limited Im uh, information we have here, I don't think we can say for certain who was right, uh, Paul or Barnabas. Paul, uh, those who say Paul was right often point to the fact that it seems Paul and Silas were sent away with the church's blessing. It says, uh, they left commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. Uh, Paul and Silas then left with the blessing of the church, uh, whereas there's no such blessing mentioned regardless uh, uh, regarding Barnabas and Mark. While I would agree that this would suggest that uh, probably there were more on Paul and Silas's side in this dispute, it's not conclusive. Uh, it's kind of an argument for silence in a way. And also, uh, it could be that, you know, Paul's forceful personality just kind of won over people. Uh, those who want to see uh, Barnabas is in the right, on the other hand, point the, to the fact that Mark went on later to have a very successful uh, ministry. So he did recover, which is great. Uh, he went on to become a very se uh, valuable servant of the Lord. According to very early uh, church tradition, Mark became one of Peter's most valued assistants. And in 1 Peter 5.13, Peter refers to Mark as my son. That's how close they were. Mark also, of course, according to early tradition, went on to write the, the gospel that bears his name, uh, which, according to tradition, is based on the memoirs of Peter, which Mark took and arranged and collected. Uh, but what's really of interest, though, is how Mark uh, went on to become a valuable and cherished, cherished assistant even to Paul. <laughs> it's a heartwarming tale to realize that uh, this young man, Mark, who had failed Paul to the point that he didn't want anything, have him to have anything to do with his ministry, at that point anyway, that later on he became a right-hand man to Paul and one of his most valued and cherished assistants. According to Colossians 4, 10, 11, when Paul was in prison, Mark was one of only four Jewish believers who came and tended to him there. And then in 2 Timothy 4, 11, this is the last epistle that Paul ever wrote, last thing he ever wrote, uh, Paul tells Timothy, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. So this is a wonderful story of redemption that uh, Paul and Mark were later reconciled, and uh, it's a story of redemption. Mark turned his life around with God's help and with Barnabas's help, that son of encouragement, and he became a valuable asset in the church. And Paul and Barnabas were also uh, reconciled. I suspect that both Barnabas and Paul had some good reasons on their side for taking the stances that they did. That's usually how it is in these things. Usually no one's 100% right, although sometimes it is. But one thing we can be sure of is that neither Paul or Barnabas probably handled this uh, situation as well as they probably could have. It says in verse 39, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Almost as telling as what is said in that verse is what's not said. There's no, and so we placed the matter before the Lord with prayer and fasting and waited upon the Lord. Or, and so we brought the matter before the whole church to see what they would say. And there's no, and so after much prayer and discussion, Paul and Barnabas still could not see eye to eye. So they decided it best to split up the work, one heading north and one heading south each committing the other to the grace of the Lord. So there's no indication here that Paul and Barnabas sought out godly and wise uh, methods to, uh, to be reconciled. As Warren Wiersbe points out, it's sad that Paul and Barnabas were able to bring peace to the church overall, but they weren't able to settle their own dispute until later. Uh, so there's nothing like that of Paul and Barnabas trying to work things through in a godly manner. Either one or both of them had not done that to some degree. That's the bad news. The good news is that it seems that what Satan had intended for evil, God used for good. It's always better, of course, not to sin in the first place. You heard that here first. <laughs> However, it's comforting to know that even when we do sin, when we do mess up, God is able to turn those things for good, as he did here. For example, in this case, 
God used this uh, event to bring about two mission teams where there had only been one prior to that. Secondly, Silas turned out to be perhaps a more uh, qualified or apt assistant to Paul than even the godly Barnabas had been. Uh, first of all, unlike Barnabas, Silas was a Roman citizen, which gave him more freedom of movement, freedom to preach, as Paul was a Roman citizen. So they kind of matched better in that way. Secondly, Silas was a leader in the Jerusalem church who was mentioned in the letter settling the issue of the Judaizers. So as Paul went to church from ch church to church, telling them the results of that meeting, the conclusions, Silas would be able to say, as a member of that church, a very respected member of that church, yes, Paul is telling the truth, that's right. So he'd be a very valuable witness to saying, no, the Gentiles can come in as they are. They don't have to be uh, circumcised and keep the law and become Jews first. So he would have been very valuable in that regard. Also, according to 1 Peter 5.13, Silas was a good writer or stenographer, and he actually wrote um, 1 Peter. Well, he wrote it down. Peter gave it to us, but... He was the secretary, and he probably also helped Paul write First and Second Thessalonians. If you look at the verses, the first verses of those two letters, Paul had an eye problem, so he usually didn't write himself. And finally, according to verse thirty-two, Silas was a prophet. He was a gifted speaker who could encourage and strengthen churches. And since Paul was going back to the churches uh, which they had planted on the first missionary journey, this has been very valuable. Uh, for strengthening those churches. It seems, therefore, that what had, uh, what they had messed up, what Satan had perhaps intended for evil, God used it for good. Uh, again, he was able to form two missionary teams where previously there had only been one. And not only that, uh, Mark and Silas both got on-the-job training, which is very valuable for both of them. They both went on to have very significant ministries in the church. There was some leadership development that happened also. That might not have happened. And, and Mark was able to do it under Barnabas, who you know, would not break a weak reed or uh, put out a, a flickering flame, but who was gentle. And uh, Silas got to go with Paul, who was well suited for him. So God used it for good that way as well. That's comforting for us to know that just as Mark was able to turn his life around completely and just as uh, God was able to bring good out of this division between Paul and Barnabas, uh, so too God can turn our lives around and fix our relationships and use uh, those broken relationships even for good over time. He can bring good out of that evil. Uh, because God is gracious, those things aren't death sentences, so to speak. I think there's another lesson to be learned here. It's been said that most men are ruined on the side of their natural propensities. In other words, sometimes our greatest strengths contain within them the seeds of our greatest weaknesses. Take Paul, for example. He was a very driven, uh, very courageous, tough, hard-nosed person. He would stand up, excuse me, he would stand up to kings and emperors. He stood up to apostles when they wandered. Uh, you know, where would the church be today without the, the courage and the drive of the Apostle Paul? But is it possible that the very thing that made Paul such a great man of God, this great strength, also perhaps would make it more difficult for him to be sympathetic to a person like Mark, who was weak and young and struggling? You know, could it be that Paul had a tough time with people who uh, had weaknesses that he would never, you know, indulge in himself? I think it's possible that Paul needed to grow in that area. I, I know it's certainly possible for me sometimes and for many of us that, you know, to be patient with people who are weak in areas where we're strong. And it could be that, you know, Paul needed to learn some of the fruits of gentleness and, and patience, uh, uh, which characterized his master, who a flickering wick would not extinguish and a bruised wick reed would not break. Jesus was very courageous like Paul, very strong, but he was also very gentle and patient with the weak. And I think, of course, we need to be that way as well. And what about Barnabas? Here was Barnabas, the son of encouragement. You know, here's the guy who always sees the best in people. Again, like Jesus, always seeing the potential and the good in people, looking beyond their faults to their, their potential. And that's a great thing. 
you know, in fact, it was uh, Barnabas, of course, who, when uh, Saul became Paul and first wanted to get together with the church, it was Barnabas who said, let's take a look at this guy. You know, I see the best in this guy. We, let's give him a chance, just like you want to give Mark a chance. So that's a very positive attribute. Uh, but could it be that the very same positive trait which allowed Barnabas to accept people and to see the best in them could perhaps blind him a bit to the need to, uh, you know, let people be seasoned and uh, to see what their limitations were and be realistic about that. Uh, you know, it, it, could it be that he was too sympathetic to the Judaizers, uh, for example, when he withdrew from the Gentiles and wouldn't, wouldn't eat with the Gentiles in Galatia? Uh, could it be that, you know, he was too accepting of people like the Judaizers and wanted to sympathize with them when he shouldn't? Uh, and could it be that his cousin Mark wasn't ready for what was happening, wasn't quite qualified, he needed more training under a patient disciple like Barnabas? And so it could be, again, that uh, Barnabas erred on the side of his strengths in this situation. Um, Sometimes our greatest strengths carry in them the seeds of our greatest weaknesses. And we need to be aware of that. As Alexander McLaren puts it, all virtues have accompanying vices which follow them around like shadows. I need not remind you how every virtue may be run to an extreme and become a vice. Liberality is exaggerated into prodigality, firmness into obstinacy, mercy into weakness, gravity into severity, tolerance into feeble conviction, humility into abjectness. So any good trait taken too far can become a bad trait. Uh, we need some balance there. So we need to watch ourselves, you know, watch that we don't err on the side of our strengths. We also need to listen to one another. There's a reason that God puts a Paul and a Barnabas in the church together, and that's so that, that we can balance each other out. Um, we need both uh, Mr. Spock and Dr. McCoy on board ship if we're going to live long and prosper. <laughs> God's designed it that way so that we can, you know, be checks and balances on each other. So we need to listen um, to each other and perhaps make some course correction based on what we hear. When we are strong, then we are weak sometimes. As Warren Wiersbe states, Paul asked regarding people, what can they do for God's work? Barnabas, on the other hand, asked, what can God's work do for them, for people? And we need to ask both those questions. You know, you know, is this person qualified for this work? If not, what can God do for them to qualify them for it? We need to see the potential in all people and not give up on anyone. We also need to be realistic about the responsibilities they are suited to carry at this time and act accordingly. Ours is a life of mercy tempered by wisdom and wisdom tempered by love and grace. Well, there's one other quick point that can be made regarding this passage, and that is that this trouble between uh, Paul and Barnabas came on the heels of a great spiritual victory. And as so often is the case, it's, again, when we're strong, that's when we're weak. You know, we're most vulnerable after our successes, ironically. We tend to let our hair down. Well, not me, but, you know, we tend to relax and let our guard down when uh, we have great victory. As I like to say, if adversity has slain its thousands, uh, success has slain its tens of thousands. So we need to be most on our guard after spiritual victories. When we are strong, then we are weak. So go in his strength and balance, uh, mercy with wisdom. Amen.